When I was a child, he never made it scary for us. He was very careful not to create trauma. And as the years went by, he shared more of his story. I almost tried to run away from my past. The farther away you are, the less you have to be reminded of where you came from and also from the trauma you carry. You have different experiences when you're a child of a survivor. My father shouted at night. He had terrible nightmares. I mean, you never actually get used to that, being awoken by somebody shouting. Her father's nightmares only ended when he died, and Marilyn Sinclair still lives with them. The survivors made Bathurst Manor their home. Sinclair grew up in this Toronto neighborhood, surrounded by Holocaust survivors. Like all the children here, she grew up with their ghosts, too. So I had friends whose parents had numbers on their arms, um, people who suffered from certain mental health issues and physical issues because of the camps, people who talked about the camps or carried a lot of trauma. But we didn't think anything of it. So this is a picture of my father in the DP camp in Germany in 1946. Trauma was normalized, and her father's before. would shape her, too. Ernie Weiss survived the infamous Auschwitz concentration camp, but rarely spoke about it at home, focusing instead on building a brighter future. And this is your place. This yes. is where you grew up. Yes, I love this house. Yeah. Left unspoken too, she says. A tremendous pressure to be happy. We honored our parents by being happy. They wanted happy children. Mm -hmm. And when you're a kid, you know, you're not always happy. But if we were sad because a boy broke up with us or a girlfriend said something mean to us, we didn't feel that we could cry or show that same level of sadness because we needed to be really good children for our survivor parents. Weiss went on to become a prominent Holocaust educator. They told us the only way you're going to get out of here is through the chimneys. Sinclair became one too, to honor her father even more. But it was only recently, after he died, after years of hiding her own feelings to protect him, that she discovered he'd spent his whole life hiding his struggle with anxiety and depression. It was hard because we thought the happy family succeeded in making him happy. And when you found out that he had been struggling? Maybe we didn't do our job as well as we tried. It was a very tense household. Uh, my father had a lot of issues with anger. It was a difficult upbringing. Willie Handler's parents, Ella and Shifra Handler, also survived the Nazis. Most of their family didn't. Their world here, he says, was small, lonely, yet crowded by the war. My parents didn't have much of a social circle, so even they didn't see very many people. To some extent, it was like maybe uh, the war never really ended, and that the, they were just still struggling to survive. Handler started to write his family story, only to find more haunted spaces. His father had lost his first family in the war, but had never mentioned his youngest daughter. Do so you think he buried the fact that he had another child because yeah, it was too hard? Definitely. Um, my father, for one month, uh, in Gross Rosen concentration camp, was a Sunder commando and he was putting bodies into crematorium, and that include babies. You know, even for a few weeks, that would traumatize you. It is history now, but um, they live inside of me, and so I'm still here. My parents' experience, their trauma has been passed on to me. Some of Handler says he used to struggle with his own anger and grew up finding safety in the shadows. I actually worked in the Ontario Public Service. One of my weaknesses was I didn't like to take a lot of credit for things. And I'm positive that it's passed down from my dad, who in the camps, one of the things that you didn't want to do was draw attention to yourself. Uh, you wanted to just blend in in the masses. Being selected out was not, usually had negative implications. Hey! Hey, big guy. Handler says he can't rewrite history, but he's grateful for a hand in the present. You. One of the things that bothered me my whole life was not having any grandparents. 
definitely with my grandkids. I cherish every moment with them and I want them to have the full experience of having grandparents so they have memories that I didn't have. <laughs> it's like monkeys. <laughs> The first thing is pride, really proud of him, really proud of his strength and not just existing, but living and enjoying life. On the other hand, it breaks my heart <laughs> to know what he went through. Arla Litwin's father survived the horror of Auschwitz too. He became a well-known Holocaust educator, but only talked to Litwin about it when she was older. There we go. Hi, Dad. How are you doing? Good. On their daily call while he's in Florida, <laughs> I asked Nate Leipziger why. How important was it for you to protect your kids from what happened to you? Well, I think this is a universal parental type of feelings. And uh, I think maybe it's an, even an instinct to protect the children. It's possible uh, to transfer to the children. How hard for it can be when they answer. He tried but he couldn't entirely shield her. Love you. Love you. Bye. Bye. This is my main pantry. And then I have a backup supply in another cupboard. And if not, then it goes straight on the shopping list and gets replenished. And there's just the two of you here? Yes. When it's empty, I just, I feel, um, it upsets me, like it's a panic. You know, oh my goodness, it's not, I, I'm not stocked. I'm missing all of these things. Where do you think that comes from? I think it comes from my father's experiences, understanding his experiences, just this feeling of insecurity, of impermanence. So Litwin also so inherited a lurking fear that it could all uh, happen again. When world events happen or when there's anti-Semitism, I go to a dark place really fast. I'll, you know, go from zero to 100, where other people are going, oh, this isn't so great. I'm like, oh my God, like, maybe we need to leave. Maybe we need to go this way. <laughs> you have actually so, thought about leaving, like having an exit plan? I mean, yes and no, it's not practical, but I, uh, I always have a, a back, what if this happened? What would I do? What if this happened? What would I do? Litwin has found comfort in the company of other children of survivors. Hello, Hi, Jory. Things that I do or ways that I think I didn't really realize was connected to being a child of a survivor. They connect in a shared past and in lessons yes. for the future too. It's important to me because it's important to my father and I've learned from him how important mutual acceptance is. We need to teach the general public how important it is to allow people to join us in freedom in this country. So, Joanna, we know from the first-hand accounts, like those, that trauma can be passed down, but there's science behind it. Yep, there was a study done several years ago focusing on Holocaust survivors, and they found how there were genetic changes caused by trauma can be passed on to the next generation. And that field is a little controversial, but there's also been work looking at inherited memory trauma, where children absorb their parents' memories as if it were their own. So we spoke to people who have regular nightmares about being in concentration camps themselves, even though they were raised in households where their parents didn't even talk about it that much, and yet they still absorbed it. So knowing that information does what? It raises awareness, and we're talking about this to now, today, because International Holocaust Remembrance Day is coming up, but there are parallels with other communities, including residential school survivors. The more we talk about it, the more we validate people's experiences, but awareness is key, too. And for the people in this story tonight, Adrian, the hope is that that awareness will help combat the rise in anti-Semitism that we've been seeing lately. Joanna, thank you. You're welcome.